Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you all to our virtual panel discussion titled New Government in Iraq, Challenges and Opportunities. I'll, I would like to inform you that this event is being recorded and it will be later published on our website. My name is Yunus Badi. I am the co-founder and executive vice president at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. The Institute for Peace and Diplomacy is a Canadian nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that aims to promote peace and stability through diplomacy and dialogue. With our research publication and panel discussions, we hope to positively contribute to foreign policy discussions here in Canada. Our vision is to build a strong grassroots think tank that empowers the progressive policymakers and peace advocates with independent research and analysis. We are dependent on, it, on individual donations of our supporters. So if you're interested to learn more about us or support us, you can visit our website at peacediplomacy.org. I'm glad that among our audience today, we have many policymakers, lawmakers, former and current diplomats, think tankers, journalists, academics, and students. Thank you all once again for attending this timely and important panel, which I have the honor of moderating today with our distinguished experts from Iraq, Iran, the US, and Sweden. Before I introduce our panelists, allow me to explain the format of the panel. We will have around 30 to 40 minutes of discussion with the panelists, and then I'll ask your question. To send in your questions, please use the Q&A feature that is available on Zoom. With that, let me now introduce our panel of experts, starting with Lahib Higgel, who is joining me today from Sweden. Lahib is a senior analyst for Iraq at the International Crisis Group. She has worked in Iraq and the Kurdistan region in various capacities since 2013. Most recently, she worked on, she worked on mediation efforts in Iraq, Libya, and Syria for the Dialogue Advisory Group. We also have Stephen Simon joining us from Washington. Stephen is currently a senior analyst at the Queens Institute for Responsible Statecraft and a professor in the practice of international relations at Colby College. Stephen served on the National Security Council as a senior director for the Middle East and North Africa from 2011 to 2012. He's also worked as a senior director for counterterrorism from 1994 to 1999. His assignments followed a 15 year career in the US State Department. Joining us from Australia, we have Ali Mamouri of Al Monitor, whom I cannot thank enough for accepting our invitation to attend this panel despite such a big time difference. Ali is a scholar and journalist who teaches political science at the University of Sydney. He has worked as a lecturer at the University of Tehran and trade, trained at seminaries in Iraq and Iran, among other posts. He is currently the editor of Al Monitor's Iraq Pulse, interestingly, a position that the new Prime Minister Mustafa Al Qazemi had previously held not too long ago. Last but not least, Hassan Ahmadian is joining us from Tehran. Ahmadian is an assistant professor of the Middle East and North Africa studies at the University of Tehran, as well as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Belfer Center, Center of Harvard Kennedy School. As you can see, we could have not put together a more qualified and diverse panel of experts to discuss important issues related to Iraq. Without further ado, let's begin our panel. After six months of political deadlock, Iraq's parliament two weeks ago finally approved a new government under the leadership of the prime minister who happens to be backed by both Tehran and Washington. Mustafa al Qazemi, former director of the Iraqi National Intelligence Service, is presiding over a coalition government that from the get-go failed to secure a full cabinet as five of his candidates were rejected for key posts such as ministers of oil and foreign relations. Yet, filling this ministerial post is not the only challenge for al Qazemi, who has promised to hold early elections within 12 to 18 months. In this limited time in power, his government is faced with a number of immediate crises, 
ranging from deteriorating economy precipitated by the COVID-19 and oil price drop to mass social unrest and increase in Islamic State insurgency in the country. Not only he must find ways to address all these complex and deep-rooted issues, but he must also deal with rising tensions between Iran and the U.S. that have put the security of Iraq and the region at great risk. With this introduction, I want to now turn it to our panelists, starting with Ali, and ask about the Prime Minister Mustafa al Qazemi himself. Ali, what makes it special about him that despite all of these challenges that I just mentioned and the same political system, his limited time in power, some still hope that he as a pragmatist would be able to bring extensive reforms to the country? Yeah, Mustafa Qazemi, uh, maybe the best uh, and the most important thing about him is uh, a compromised prime minister, the one that all parties internally and uh, from outside all agreed about him. He's maybe the only one that can serve uh, the country at this critical uh, moment because he's accepted by Iran and US, by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, by Turkey and Arab world, and uh, internally, uh, most of the political parties, except a very few small uh, one, uh, agreed uh, about him and uh, are ready to cooperate with him in this uh, very difficult situation. Uh, we have uh, three main challenges. Uh, it's the economic crisis, it's uh, the security uh, with the, a new wave of ISIS and with the protesters and with the militias working outside of the state, and we have the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, in this difficult situation, the only one can work is the one that uh, all parties are agreed to come under his umbrella and support him, uh, and also the uh, outsiders that have a, a boot in the country, uh, they accept also to work with him and support him. Uh, so far, uh, he was able to use all this credit uh, to make a cabinet that represents uh, all parties uh, from different angles and aspects. And uh, he worked so far uh, very cautiously uh, to uh, preserve uh, the confidence of uh, different parties that backed him uh, for the post. Uh, but still we are waiting for the future to see uh, will he be able to go ahead to address uh, most more difficult uh, situations and crises, uh, more importantly about uh, the salaries and the economy, mm -hmm. uh, the basic services, and etc., and uh, the militia and the conflict between Iran and U.S. Uh, Iraq uh, clearly become a battleground between uh, these two power in last six, five months, uh, and uh, the pandemic, uh, which is rising now in the country, uh, we have a new wave of it. Uh, these uh, three main things, uh, it's the main challenges of the Prime Minister, and uh, we need to wait to see if he will be able to address them or not. Yeah, these are all the topics that we will be covering uh, during this panel. But uh, do you think that he would be able to make these extensive reforms? We know that the prime minister has made, for example, its priority to reform electoral laws, including the Iraqi High Electoral Commission, which indeed is one of the main demands of the protesters. Regarding that, I have two questions. Uh, you, can answer, you can answer those, and then we can also move to other panelists if they have any comments to share. One is that how much of these uh, proposed reforms are implementable in practice? And do you think that such reforms will bring his government on Iraq's uh, political system, as we know it as Muhassasa, or the quota-based a political system, the legitimacy it needs to first survive and then function well? Look, we cannot be perfectionist about Iraq. We need to be realistic. Uh, the situation in Iraq uh, is very difficult and 
the prime minister has about two years to implement uh, his plan. It's not a, a long period, it's a very short period. Mm -hmm. uh, he promised for early election, uh, which I see very difficult to be done uh, before two years because we have a lot of steps before that it should be done. Uh, but uh, anyway, he prepared the plan uh, before he go to the parliament. And the plan was very realistic, and uh, the plan seems to be uh, seems to be uh, pragmatic and realistic. And I think he would be able to implement a big part of it at least. Uh, first of all, he wants to uh, reform the electoral law. We already have a approved electoral law, new electoral law by the parliament. But because of the disagreement between different political parties, it uh, was not sent to the president uh, to, to get finalized. Uh, so still the parliament needs to work on it. Uh, the new electoral law cannot be perfect as well because there are a lot of challenges in this area. Uh, the last uh, electoral law was based on San Ligo. Uh, plan which was given a lot of uh, privilege and advantages to big parties over the small parties. The new one uh, is based on uh, personal voting, uh, which is good, but at the other side, it will give more power to uh, populist uh, parties like Moktad Asad, like Asael, and other militias, which is also dangerous. Uh, so uh, I think Mustafa Kazim will work on some kind of between uh, a new electoral law that uh, can uh, cover the both sides. Uh, from one side, uh, share the power between different political parties and from the other side, uh, prevent to give uh, a privilege to the populist uh, movements. Uh, and we need to have a new uh, electoral commission as, as well. Uh, the previous one was uh, elected by the political parties, which wasn't fair. You cannot give uh, the authority of the election to the parties themselves that they are attending the election. Uh, the new proposed one that is not uh, approved and finalized yet as well, uh, it uh, gave the authority to uh, judges but also this one is against the, against of the principle of separation of power. We have executive power, we have judiciary, and we have the, uh, the parliament. We cannot uh, mix them together. Uh, so um, probably he will go ahead with having an electoral commission elected from a retired uh, judge, which are not under the authority of judiciary system anymore so they can be more impartial. Uh, yeah. And also, he promised to present a new uh, political parties law, uh, which is very important because the current political parties uh, are not, uh, are not uh, honest with the people and there is no enough, uh, there is no enough transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know exactly where these parties get their finance from and how they build uh, their power in the country. Uh, these three steps should be done. And after that, he can go to the early election. Uh, at the same time, he needs to work uh, about the uh, economy. He already sent uh, his representative to Saudi Arabia to invite uh, Saudis for investing uh, in Iraq. He also is working on making Iraq uh, a bridge and a table of cooperation between different parties. He still wants to continue the cooperation with uh, Iran. At the same time, he wants to invite other sides uh, to work in Iraq. Ali, before we get to the regional uh, politics of the region, how politics of Iraq and how uh, Iraq is going to go about the economy, I want to first still focus on the internal matters. And I want to uh, know what Lahib also thinks about the proposed reforms that uh, Ali uh, just talked about. And do you think along with this uh, proposed reform, uh, what else Al-Qasimi could do 
again, apart from also releasing the detained protesters, setting up, for example, truth commit, the Truth Finding Commission and providing compensation for the families of killed protesters so that he's not still seen as part of the system or an elite ruler in the eyes of the protesters because we, as we know, we had a few uh, hundreds of people protesting uh, just a few days ago against uh, Mustafa al Qasim. So how we can go about these reforms that he's not still seen as the representative of the current system? Sorry, the question is regarding to me or? No, that's regarding to Lahib. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah. So just something uh, quick on the uh, on the electoral reform. Ali mm -hmm. covered most of it. Um, I think one aspect, though, that is uh, important to mention is that there is still a lot of disagreement within uh, Parliament on this issue. The the law is is not complete, and um, these issues were also really clear in the uh, selection process of uh, Mustafa Al Kadhimi, which uh, was really complicated between. Uh, the main blocks, and this is also why we see now that the cabinet is, is not complete. Um, these divisions that exist uh, are also uh, specific to the to the law, depending on on what sort of parties it will serve. So it is very likely that uh, the reform is going to be delayed, and mm -hmm. uh, that Kadhimi might not be able to deliver on the promise to have elections early. So that's one part of it. Um, as, as to some of the other steps that he has committed to, um, for the protesters, uh, their demands cannot be met early enough. So it is clear that there are going to be unrest still on the streets, as we have seen in, in, in Basra and in, in Diwaniya and Wasit and in other places. Um, however, the, the protest movement is, is also split, whereas you can definitely see that there is some patience in terms of waiting uh, Kadami out and see if he can deliver. Um, so some of these steps have been important, especially when he has interfered in specific situations to get detainees released. This has happened both in Diwani and Basra and Kut, for example. Um, and it and it's speaking with with uh, some of these people that have been released they've said that you know we understand that uh that he seems to mean what he is saying uh however the this needs to happen on a on a greater scale and that is what is really uh difficult to in, implement he needs the judiciary on his side um and so it really remains to be seen whether he is going to be successful i don't think that uh, he can actually deliver on this uh, on full scale, let's say, uh, but potentially in, in specific cases. And also, uh, the investigation committee needs a long time to look into these things. And the question is whether the protest movement will have patience until results can actually uh, be presented to the public. Thank you very much. And I think another crisis that his government is also facing, apart from the legitimacy crisis and what happened uh, before with the protests, is the economic issues that he sees ahead of himself with the drop in the oil price, which 90% of the state revenue comes from, as well as the situation with COVID-19. The government has no options but to take austerity measures, which means moving toward taxations and cuts in government programs. But wouldn't this lead to more people joining the protesters or uh, in other wars, wouldn't that create another wave of protests in Iraq? Uh, we can have uh, Steve Simon a comment on that and we can, and then if anybody else has comments, they can definitely share it. Thanks. I'm probably not the best person to comment on the question, um, but suffice it to say that it's not just the factors that you outlined, um, but the level of corruption uh, in Iraq, I think, is a serious uh, political issue and, and uh, a profound trigger uh, for unrest. I mean, this has been a pattern really established in the Arab Spring revolts of 2011 and 2012, corruption and perceived corruption, or perceptions of corruption, um, uh, were uh, uh, serious irritants, and they got people out on the streets. And you can, you, you can see this and hear it in personal narratives um, 
of participants in the revolts uh, in other Arab countries, which, uh, you know, uh, Iraq escaped back in, in, in the 2011-2012 timeframe. And I think you could look at the current state of uh, popular unrest as uh, the Arab Spring finally reaching, in a way, um, uh, uh, Iraq. And so when you throw in uh, corruption uh, along with these other factors you mentioned, you know, particularly emerging shocks, like uh, COVID and the collapse in oil prices, we don't know actually how durable that collapse will, will prove to be. There's already some recovery um, uh, in oil prices, which uh, will comfort the regime, I suppose, um, uh, give it a little bit more flexibility in dealing with some of this dissatisfaction. But um, when, uh, when you just add up all these factors and then you know, superimpose uh, the fact that violence is being used by the government uh, to um, uh, suppress these demonstrations. You're looking at a, uh, at a serious longer term problem that's going to impede the kinds of reforms or the implementation of the reforms that uh, Ali and, La and, and Laib have both uh, discussed. And when you look at those reforms, and I was particularly struck when Ali was speaking, he, he sort of described all the moving parts mm -hmm. uh, that were involved in this uh, ambitious program of reform. And, uh, you know, all I, can, <laughs> all I can think was, when he was running through that list was, how can a, a political economy that is so besieged mm -hmm right now, and which so many of the incentive structures that have impeded reform in the past still exist pretty much unchanged, uh, except in, in, in a sense in a more difficult um, uh, environment. How can they ever be implemented? It's just, it, it, I, I'm just, uh, you know, um, uh, highly skeptical. I imagine that, you know, Iraqis will muddle through. Um, but, you know, it will be difficult. And there were other external shocks um, uh, that uh, might still be applied to what is a, a pretty fragile, you know, system right now. And, and, and those shocks might emerge from a clash between um, uh, the United States and Iran uh, it taking place within an Iraqi context. We've already seen a bit of that. So, um, uh, I, you know, I suppose I'm a bit pessimistic right now. But do you think that uh, it, for Iraq, in order to temporarily deal with this economic, with these economic issues, they would go about asking for external support, like they did in 2014 from, from IMF, or they, could they even turn to the U.S. for some financial support so they could at least, you know, pay for some of the costs that they basically cannot anymore because of the drop in the oil price? Yeah, the, the, this is problematic, uh, in part because uh, the Trump administration, I think, is deeply ambivalent about its relationship with Iraq um, and, and can't decide really whether Iraq is a friend or an enemy or, or something in between. Um, uh, the new political leadership in Iraq uh, will have to negotiate you know that and and try and persuade the trump administration that um you know iraq is a is still a worthy recipient of uh u.s affections um, but um uh the decision making process in washington now is so diffuse um uh that you know it's hard to see uh, you know, a systematic and coherent posture towards Iraq emerging, um, you know, from the uh, Washington process. Uh, the, and the second factor is COVID. I mean, the United States is now entering a fairly deep recession. Uh, its uh, GDP has been cut quite considerably. Uh, there are something like 30 million unemployed in the United States. Um, the stimulus package is really quite enormous. And that's going to crowd out um, uh, foreign assistance. 
you know, the, it, when, when you have a situation, as one sees now in the United States, where the military uh, uh, budget is going to face serious cuts in the FY 2021 cycle, the fiscal year 2021 cycle, and the five year um, uh, spending plan that is based on that, uh, on that uh, administration's budget submission. There's, if the military is, is, is going to be kicked in the shins because of COVID, um, you can bet that foreign assistance um, uh, will be uh, as well. And the IMF itself is going to be really stretched. Uh, so I think it's, you know, the capacity of the, of the system, as it were, uh, to meet um, uh, Iraq's economic shortfalls, even if they're temporary, I, I think is is seriously constrained. Yeah, I think one of at least one of the, to me one of the positive development uh, in terms of Iraq U.S. relation was at least that the United States, after confirmation of Prime Minister Al Qasimi, announced that it would provide Iraq with its 120-day waiver to import electricity from Iran, which is pretty important as we as we are in the summer basically and that's pretty much needed and this used to be only 30 days during the last government so that's 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 a very positive development to me and we cannot talk about iraq's economic issues without uh, discussing u.s u.s iran tensions in iraq and as we know just a few days ago a rocket landed new near the u.s embassy in Baghdad's green zone the rock, the rocket attack, like several others, were not was not claimed by any groups. However, the U.S. has always blamed the Qatar Hezbollah for these attacks. And uh, Mr. Ahmadian, what kind of message do you think this attack could send to Al Qasimi uh, after days of his uh, appointment as a prime minister? Uh, uh, and thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, I think, uh, well, we're not sure who, who uh, pulled it off to speak about the attack, but uh, all in all, I think there are uh, factions in Iraq that are not satisfied with the fact that Kabami made it to the premiership. And they are moving against it, starting their, you know, uh, acts. As for Iran, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Kabami uh, prime minister and premiership came as, came as a, uh, actually as a compromise uh, for Iranians. See, there are many internal uh, developments that were discussed by uh, uh, my co-panelists uh, that I uh, can add some points to them. But uh, beyond these, uh, this dimension, internal, you know, changes and uh, challenges that are facing his uh, Kabami's uh, government. I think the regional and international aspect of it is quite as important as the internal dimension. I think uh, one part of it, and I think the main part of it, is Iran U.S. tension in Iraq. This can have a positive or a negative effect depending on the developments on Qadabi's uh, government. So we, not long ago, Iran and the United States has a, had a gentleman agreement to work with Iraq to support their friends there, to play the uh, uh, democratic game in Iraq, though it wasn't perfect, but still it lowered the tension, decreased you know, confrontation between the two on Iraqi soil. But with, with Trump at the helm, things changed. Uh, the maximum pressure campaign, Iraq became uh, a, a proxy theater of it, or a proxy ground for it. So uh, the United States started pushing against the Iraqi government to cut ties or to severe ties with Iran, or lower the you know, uh, trade and economic engagement with Iran. Uh, it, it started pushing back against the uh, popular mobilization units. It started to, and after uh, all these efforts didn't materialize as the U.S. administration wanted, they, they targeted Iran directly. And I mean, uh, the Major General uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, his assassination is part of this view that Iran should be squeezed as much as it, the United States can uh, do. So uh, this part is, I think, uh, is quite as important as the internal challenges to uh, Kabami's government. Now with him, 
being the, the only issue I can say that uh, Iran and the Trump administration agreed on. It's the only issue in the region that called them is premiership. So it's a positive sign. We can, I mean, the Iranians supported him. Uh, he, he's not the perfect can candidate for them, but still they want to, they want stability to see st a, a more stable Iran because they have their plate full in other issues in the region and their, you know, uh, 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 tension with the United States in the region. So they need a bit of stability in Iraq. They need to, the trade to, to go uh, as, uh, as, as it was before. They need to uh, uh, lower the tension between them and the United States on Iraqi soil uh, because of the many challenges they are facing. So Iran's endorsement of Kadami, I think, is a uh, sort of giving the United States a, a way to climb down the tree they went up without an alternative policy, uh, pushing against Iran, pushing against its allies in, the, in Iraq, and destabilizing. I mean, uh, being a force of uh, instability rather than stability as it was before, at least uh, not uh, trying to, you know, confront Iran within Iraq. So. Do, do you think that the recent increase in the ISIS activities in Iraq are going to convince some Iraqi political groups, as well as Iran, to want to postpone their main demand in, uh, since uh, the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani, that they would want the, put, to postpone the withdrawal of U.S. troops in Iraq? Or do you think that Iran or these political groups inside Iraq are still going to demand al Qasemis? government to go ahead and at least publicly support this initiative, which still is going to be very complicated given that next month the U.S. is holding a strategic dialogue uh, with Iraq in Baghdad. The vision, I wouldn't say it's a goal, it's a vision, uh, you know, uh, outlined by Iranian decision makers that the United States should leave the region because it's acting, you know, uh, irresponsibly uh, with regards to uh, the region's stability after the assassination, and you, you know, all the uh, tit for tat things that happened between the, the Iran and the United States. Uh, but having that vision is one thing, and forcing Iraqis to uh, uh, push back against the United States is another. I don't think Iran wants to do something directly against the United States to force it out. It wants Iraqis to do the job. And it thinks that Iraqis eventually will do it because they can see that this tension has two uh, you know, dimensions. One, one, one is the Iranian one and the other is the, the U.S. one. And the U.S. has not been so much, uh, I mean, it has not been constructive in recent months. Uh, and the tit for tat, uh, you know, brought instability to Iraq. So I think ISIS comes in as a maybe as a as 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 a factor that can uh, facilitate a more constructive approach on the part of the U.S. and Iran to uh, at least turn a blind eye for for the time being to push back against this rising threat. But I think the, the ultimate or the uh, vision, the, the, the long-term vision of Iran will remain the same as they see that, you know, even constructive engage engagement within the Iran nuclear deal with the United States didn't result in a recognition of Iran's regional role, its independence, and, and, uh, et cetera. So they, they are, you know, playing the way the United States is playing with, with regards to Iran they are trying to push back against the maximum pressure. And I think this will uh, be the long-term vision and policies will, will have uh, some, you know, some of that vision in them in the future. Ali, do you have uh, any comments on this issue? Look, the disability in Iraq, uh, it's not a responsibility of one side. Uh, most of the foreign actors who are working inside Iraq, in addition to the current political system uh, having uh, a part of this responsibility. Uh, before Adel Abdel Mahdi government, there was an agreement written and unwritten between Iran and uh, Arab world and US 
to help uh, Iraq to get out of the ISIS crisis. In the time of Ebadi, Haider Ebadi, the prime minister, uh, was very successful in bringing all these rivals together. And they all worked together to push ISIS out of the country, uh, ISIS that was expected to remain in Iraq for about 10 years as Barack Obama predicted in the beginning of uh, ISIS rise in Iraq in 2014. Uh, it was removed in about three years because of this cooperation. But when Adel Abdel Mahdi came to the power, uh, the balance changed. Iran uh, started to, uh, to get over the power completely. First of all, it pushed its proxies in uh, Basra to close a U.S. consulate. And after that, against the PMU law, uh, it supported the PMU to attend the election and go to the parliament. It's against the PMU law. As a military faction, you cannot attend the election. Election should be attended and participated by only political parties, not by armed group. And they were, they were able to form the second largest block in the parliament that was uh, uh, was a part of bringing Adel Abdel Mahdi to the power. In the time of Adel Abdel Mahdi, Iran was almost the only part, the only party that had the upper hand in Iraq. Uh, and unfortunately, Adel Abdel Mahdi was not able, like his uh, previous uh, prime minister, Haider Abadi, to uh, keep this balance. The balance changed. And Adel Abdel Mahdi was not able to provide the basic uh, services. And after that, he dealt with the protest in a very bad way. Protest was always there from Nuri Maliki time until now. But the worst kind of a treatment was done by Adel Abdel Mahdi. He started killing them, or at least being silent about the militias that uh, took action against the protest. So all this situation brought us to uh, current uh, status that we are in it now. And now I think the only thing now uh, Kazem is thinking about to get back to at least to the uh, Haydar Ebadi time in terms of the balance between the different actors working in, in Iraq. I can't hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. And I wanted to ask uh, Lahib about Iran-U.S. tensions in Iraq and how uh, Mustafa al-Qazami could go about this and manage its relationship with two, two countries, given that both alliances are important. At the same time, uh, we know that, as I said earlier, that the strategic dialogue with the U.S. is coming up next month. And Iran, uh, as uh, Ali mentioned earlier, chose, I mean, was a, uh, appointment of uh, Mustafa al Khazir was a compromise for it. So how would uh, the prime minister would be able to basically manage this uh, relationship with two countries? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so a few things, just going back to what we said earlier. Um, obviously, one of the major issues here is, is the, the, the question of coalition forces presence. Um, and this came, the, the decision in parliament, which was a non-binding resolution um, that came just after the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Mahandis. I think the important thing to remember here is, is that it was an immediate reaction. You see that the Shia parties, uh, and it was only Shia parties, that voted on this resolution. Some of them today would say that they are not against uh, coalition forces presence in Iraq. Also, several of these parties, I mean, of course, you have um, uh, Kitab Hezbollah, Sa'ab Ahl al-Haq, uh, these sort of groups have not retracted from uh, from their stance on, on U.S. expulsion, uh, also Sadr. Um, but several of these groups have said that what we want to see coming out of the strategic dialogue is a timeline. And 
in fact, this is precisely what this dialogue is supposed to do. Uh, there has been a plan in the making for a long time of moving uh, the coalition forces presence from this, uh, the phase three that they call it into phase four, uh, which essentially means handing over more responsibility to the Iraqi security forces and assessing the need uh, on the ground. There is also conversations about changing um, the role uh, of the coalition forces into um, uh, a lead by, by NATO forces, for example. So there are several things that can come out of this uh, that will calm down uh, this conversation or let's say the, the, the rhetoric on, on part of uh, some of these militia groups in Iraq. However, um, I agree, of course, with Hassan that, that the long-term vision of these groups and Iran as well is, of course, uh, U.S. withdrawal. But I don't think that um, this is something that uh, we will see or that even uh, the, the bigger part of, of uh, Iraqi uh, uh, political groups will actually push for. Um, and in, in terms of other things, I mean, the, the election of, of Mustafa al kadhimi and the uh, endorsement by Iran also comes at the backdrop of what is Iran is going through itself, of course, which is uh, a severe economic situation, bo both due to oil prices, sanctions, and COVID. And um, uh, Iraq is a crucial market for Iran. So Iran cannot afford seeing the Iraqi economy collapsing uh, because the U.S. is no longer willing to extend sanctions wa waivers, for example. So Iran has needed to see uh, some sort of de-escalation with the U.S. and Iraq. Um, this was a way uh, to do that. And so, as you mentioned, we've seen the extension of the sanctions waiver for, for 120 days. And I think that there will be more coming out of the strategic dialogue in terms of um, uh, economic uh, aid to Iraq that will be facilitated uh, partly by the, by the U.S. to also um, uh, encourage the IMF to to support Iraq. Uh, thank you very much, Lahib. And I want to ask Simon, is that how much of, uh, I well understand the importance of the strategic dialogue, but at the same time, uh, does it make sense for Iraq or for the US to think about their relations long-term, knowing that both governments in Iraq and the US could be gone uh, in a year or two? How much of the strategic dialogue could be uh, thought out as a long-term initiative between both countries? That's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I think the United States and Iraq are uh, pretty much inextricably linked, uh, you know, uh, we know how long the United States has been in Iraq. Uh, the degree to which the United States uh, has invested uh, in Iraq. Um, now, of course, <laughs> you know, investment uh, presupposes, uh, you know, an increase in capital value and a return, uh, you know, accordingly. So it may not be the right word, but it's the word that, uh, you know, that Americans who are interested in the U.S.-Iraqi relationship uh, tend to use. Um, uh, so, you know, the U.S.-Iraqi relationship is, you know, is, is pretty hardwired at this point. And if, if uh, this is speculation, of course, but if uh, uh, Vice President Biden is elected in November, then uh, I would expect to see um, uh, not sure what the right, what the right words are, but but a more uh, uh, fruitful or productive relationship between uh, the two countries uh, in the in the Obama administration. Uh, Vice President Biden was sort of the um, the lead uh, policymaker, uh, as it were, on Iraq, and um, uh, Tony Blinken, who is very close to. Um, to Vice President Biden, and will no doubt have a senior uh, position in a Biden administration, uh, uh, I think has, um, uh, you know, I think uh, fairly strong feelings about the U.S.-Iraqi uh, relationship and would want to see it um, uh, prosper. And in particular, 
uh, I don't think that a Biden administration would take the sort of countervailing uh, steps uh, that, for example, the Trump administration uh, has taken, particularly in the form of uh, attacking military targets within Iraqi territory, which on its face would seem to derogate from uh, Iraqi sovereignty and the legitimacy of its government. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that sort of thing will uh, would come to an end. Uh, and, and you might see a more you know, amicable and, and productive relationship between, uh, between the two countries. Again, the resources that the United States will have to deploy, um, uh, whether it's in a second Trump, Trump term or in a Biden administration, will be really uh, curtailed by what looks like a prolonged and difficult uh, economic recovery from the damage inflicted uh, by the necessary um, uh, fiscal and monetary response uh, to um, uh, to the COVID uh, outbreak in the United States. So the, the U.S. won't necessarily have a whole lot to play with. Um, the U.S. is already consolidating its military presence in Iraq. It's vacated a re really rather large base. Um, uh, it's still maintaining its overall uh, force posture um, uh, in Iraq, about 5,200 personnel. Uh, that's not a lot, um, you know, given the size of the U.S. military. It's, uh, it's an infinitesimal um, uh, number of, uh, you know, of troops. I don't see that number increasing. Uh, in the fight against ISIS, uh, it, uh, it, regardless of the theater of operations, the fight against ISIS would be carried out mostly by local forces um, with the technical uh, assistance uh, of the United States and and sometimes with the direct participation of U.S. forces, but most, mostly it's been a local, you know, burden, uh, which um, uh, the affected countries have borne, uh, I think, quite courageously, um, uh, especially Iraq, I think, in this, you know, in this regard. So, um, you know, if, but if Trump is reelected, then there'll be more of this, uh, uh, to some degree, we're sort of running hot and cold. So, you know, one minute uh, declaring uh, Iraq uh, to be a real problem because of its uh, proximity to Iran um, uh, politically and, and uh, the government's tolerance for uh, militias that are viewed as uh, umbilically linked, you know, to Iran in some sense, especially Qatayb Hezbollah or, um, or, I don't know, there's several, uh, uh, so, um, you know, that's, so that'll, they'll, they'll sort of be on the tough side, but then, you know, they'll sort of back off, they'll extend waivers, they'll do things that that seemed to soften the touch, but a Biden administration might be a little bit more systematic, that's what I'm saying. Okay, basically with the Trump administration, if elected in November, we're gonna see the continuation of the same agenda or the same policy uh, with Iraq. And uh, with that, I want to now uh, ask some of the questions that have been submitted from our audience. Uh, our first question is directed at uh, Hassan Ahmadian. Uh, Prof, I'm just reading it uh, directly. Uh, Prof, Pro Professor Ahmadian wrote an article about Iran's strategy in Syria. In the article, he said that Iran's presence in Syria is about establishing deterrence against Israel. Some perhaps can be said about Lebanon. What is Iran's strategic goal in Iraq? Deterrence or hegemony? Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, with regards to Iran's policy and or uh, goals in Iraq, uh, I would say that uh, the general theme is that Iran wants a friendly Iraq that cannot pose a threat to it, 
this threat is not only related to Iraq itself, it includes, most importantly, the United States. Ever since 2003, the Iranians saw the most, you know, the strongest military in the world on their borders. So they, uh, you know, had the, uh, the, the, the hard job of balancing this force. I think this balancing endeavor is part of a main part of Iran's policy with regards to Iraq and in Iraq. So uh, this is part of it, but it's not only about that. I think Iranians want to see a more friendly Iraq that is that at least cannot turn hostile to Iran. I think they have this, uh, you know, uh, confidence that they have achieved this goal already. Uh, there is no, you know, if it's a democratically elected government, it cannot be anti-Iran. If it's a compromised government, it cannot also be against Iran. So it, 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 it will work with Iran in one way or another. So there's this confidence that you hear it in the Iranian strategic circles that uh, Iraq cannot turn against Iran because it's, it's I mean, it's ruling elite, it's, it's uh, a, a constituencies all over the country, not only about the southern Iraq, they are not hostile to Iran. They might not like Iran, Iraq tension, Iran US tension on their soil, which is something that Iran is also uh, reluctant to, but uh, they, they are not hostile to Iran. I think this confidence builds a, a, a better understanding of uh, Iraq's situation. Now, with regards to uh, Ali's point, I wanted to raise a, uh, I, I wanted to have a comment, if, 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 if I may. So uh, I think, you know, the appointment of Adil Abdel Mahdi, uh, I mean, the, the maximum pressure campaign of the United States against Iran that hit Iraq as well, predates Adil Abdel Mahdi's appointment as a prime minister. Uh, and we all, uh, you know, remember that uh, Haider al-Abadi's uh, uh, comments on the necessity to stick to, you know, if, if there's a sanction, we will stick to it. That played a big role in Iran's attitude towards him, in him being a single-term prime minister. Then Adil Abdel Mahdi was elected. So, the, you know, the maximum pressure and its uh, pitfalls on Iraq and Iran-U.S. tension predates Adil Abdel Mahdi. Then Iran played a different role in, uh, with regards to the United States. So Iran's policy in Iraq, I don't see it as changing. It only adjusted to the new U.S. policy in Iraq. And I think it's also, nowadays, it's also adjusting to the U.S. policy, which is going back to a uh, more you know, constructive rather than a, uh, an all or none policy uh, with regards to Iraq and looking at Iraq through the, uh, the, the, the Iranian uh, angle. Perfect. Now we have actually another question for uh, Ali. Uh, uh, I'm just reading out the question. When we think about Iraq, we only think of two allies, the U.S. and Iran. How much can Iraq or the new government specifically count on other allies such as China or Europeans and even Russia to support its recovery? Look, uh, actually Mustafa Kazemi was uh, behind the Haider Ebadi campaign to reach Arab world in particular and to diversify the alliance with Iraq. Uh, and uh, he did his best in the time of Haider Ebadi to uh, open up with uh, Suri in particular. And in his first days, he also sent his uh, most prominent um, minister, the Minister of Finance, Ali Abdel Amir Allawi, uh, who is very well respected in the Arab world, uh, to Saudi Arabia. He uh, went to Saudi Arabia yesterday to invite them for several investments in Iraq. One of them is agriculture in Ambar, uh, which can be uh, like an alternative for the loss of uh, oil price drop. Uh, and also, uh, he has very good relationship with Jordan, which can be used also for some kind of a trading and transit. Uh, he has a plan for uh, activating of uh, transit highway between Basra to Aqaba, 
and uh, several other plants that he's working with, which uh, require naturally uh, different allies, not just Iran and US, uh, need to have this alliance to implement this kind of uh, regional plan, which is not just related to Iraq. Uh, if I may also, I want to comment very shortly on uh, my friend Ahmadian. Uh, look, uh, Iran policy for not having Iraq as a hostile neighbor, it was in the beginning of 2003, when Iran was scared of uh, being the second target of US. Uh, George W. Bush that time was talking about uh, the axle of evils, and he was talking about Syria and Iran. But gradually, Iran found Iraq much more uh, found much more potential in Iraq. Iraq become a battleground. Iraq become uh, an investment for uh, turning around the sanction, and Iraq become a strategic highway to uh, Mediterranean Sea. That's why Iran worked to locate its proxies in Mosul, in Nineveh, in uh, southern Kirkuk, in Salah Eddin, and he invested for years in Imam Ali military base uh, in the Iraqi border with Syria and Turkey. Uh, so it becomes something very bigger than it was expected in the beginning. Uh, now it seems that Iran is reducing its expectation and minimizing it to less than what it was looking for. Uh, not just having Iran as an enemy doesn't match with the strategy, strategy of uh, building several militias. We have about 70 militias in Iran. About more than 20 of them are completely loyal to Iran, and they are not under control of Iraqi state at all. Okay, thank you for your comments, Ali. And uh, this is our last question directed at uh, Lahib. Uh, how much do you think the new Prime Minister, Mustafa al Qasimi, will be on board with the withdrawal of US forces from the country? Um, well, I, I don't think that he is on board with that. I think uh, that there is a, a compromise that is going to be struck. I mean, if you look at uh, Iraq and the decision makers in, in, in Parliament, um, again, going back to the point about uh, the vote that was held right after the killing of Mohandas and Soleimani, it was only attended by Shia parties. Um, Kurds and Sunnis are, are not with the withdrawal of U.S. forces and also Shia parties including for example uh, Haider al-Abadi's uh, Nasser uh, coalition and, and later also several other parties have uh, explained that they see some more nuance into what it means to have uh, U.S. forces in the country. Uh, that makes a majority. Um, so. I, I don't see him being on board uh, with a complete withdrawal. I don't, I don't think that that is at all what it is that we are looking for uh, in the short to medium term. Perfect. And let's Steve also respond uh, to this last question, if you have time. I, I agree with Light. I, mean, I don't. I don't see the new government in Iraq as wanting to see a major change in the U.S.-Iraqi relationship that, that would be represented by the withdrawal of U.S. forces. I can't see that. And I also don't see that he's under um, uh, serious pressure to do so. And this is another point on which I agree with Lahib. I mean, I, I, I don't see the constituencies out there. Um, that would demand uh, the withdrawal of U.S. forces, uh, you know, so strongly that uh, that the government would have to respond in some fashion. I just don't, I don't see that. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I would uh, like to thank all of our panelists for accepting our invitation and joining me for this panel.